Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Anne is the co-principal investigator and director of the Body Track Project, which she started around 2010, and she's here to talk to you about today. And she's from Carnegie Mellon University, the Create Lab, correct? Correct. All right, welcome, Anne. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and we have a little extra introductory treat here um, from Gordon. Gordon does Microsoft Research. I met Anne at the Quantified Self annual meeting at Stanford last month and through a doctor, Jack Abramson, who has a project with a number of trackees who are using body track to capture health data to understand cause and effect. <clears throat> I'm a trackee collecting symptoms and body characteristics for someone who's had two heart attacks, two bypasses and two pacemakers with the goal of extending my own end of life. And also seek synergistic efforts such as quantified self and quant friendly doctor. Perhaps there could be something synergistic with MSR. So here's Anne, who may be using my recent data that includes sleep, lack of exercise, and pain when I do exercise. So now all there is left is to analyze. Okay, now, tell you a bit of my own story. Um, <clears throat> let me get my thingy going here. Um, so uh, as, as she said, I'm a robotic systems engineer. I worked at NASA Ames Research Center um, as um, lead systems engineer for prototype Mars rovers for many years. And this is, this is Mars Akkad and K9. And, um, um, and that was a really great job. I really enjoyed it. And then I got too sick to do it anymore. <laughs> Um, and this was this was a, a real disappointment, um, and it was it was all the sort of you know vague stuff that that messes with your ability to to do what you care about, but it comes up negative on all the tests. And um, after pushing things as as hard as I could, and realizing that you know I'm the, I'm not going to get really a useful answer out of out of the standard standard medical system except for what it's not, <laughs> uh, but nothing kind of useful about how to run my life better to be able to suffer less. Um, I said, well, okay, I know how to debug one-off systems. I'm a one-off system. What can I do here? And this was before the quantified self-movement started and actually several years before uh, I, I actually found out about it. But um, did a lot of the same sort of things. You know, found um, trackers that, that, that I could, you know, like the heart rate straps and, and started taking mixtures of food and, and recording what I was eating and things like that. And um, I, I did eventually come up with an answer that allowed me to, you know, feel much, much better most of the time. Um, but in the process, I was really, really frustrated with the tools. Um, and in the, in the end, the, the answer I found, actually, the, the most useful thing was, was taking the, photo, the, the pictures of the, of the food. Because it did turn out to be a food issue. Um, luckily, the, um, when I kind of hit the bottom of the barrel, the, the, the doctor sent me to Ayurveda. And he said, this is Vata imbalance. Ayurveda is like thousands of years old Indian science. You know, go, go figure out what they say to do about Vata imbalance. And from paying attention to what I was eating when, and when I was at home cooking you know, the way they said, I would get better. And then I would go out to, to dinner. And just about anything I went out and ate, no matter how hard I tried, um, it would, would be a problem. And, and I would pay attention to the, the few that succeeded and the many that failed and try to find a pattern and eventually figured out it seemed to be an issue with nightshade, uh, which is tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, stuff in that family, which turned out to have neurotoxins in them. Apparently, some people seem to have problems with them. This is obscure knowledge that no one is, is ever going to tell you about. But there's a lot of people who figured it out experimentally, and they, they write really, really crappy books. Um, <laughs> maybe someday somebody who can write well will write such a book. Um, but um, in the process, basically, I said, well, you know, this goes against everything that I, th I thought the about the way the world worked. You know, that everything I've heard is that vegetables are good for you. These are vegetables, therefore, they're good for you. But somehow, my experience is, is different. So are there other examples of people who've had these similar sort of experiences where they, through paying attention and experimenting, have figured out that um, there's something about the way they react to, to the world that is significantly enough different than the way that they expect based on what they've been told that, um, 
they really do a whole lot better if they come up with sort of custom strategies, right? Their own user's manual. And there's, there's examples in all sorts of ways. And people sort of know about um, um, the, the, the typical you know, peanut and pollen allergies and stuff like that. People are starting to learn about celiac disease. But those are just the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, all sorts of really weird stuff. The, the weirdest actually was my, my boss at, at NASA Ames is allergic to talc. And uh, he had a problem where he would, he would itch uncontrollably whenever he was in a warm room um, for like 10 years. It turns out he was dosing himself with talc in his supplements. And we figured that out. You stopped, you know, he figured out it's in rice and all sorts of these other things. You know, talc is an unlisted ingredient. Um, now he's fine. So and there's, there's, you know, there's, he may be unique in the universe, but he figured it out. So uh, how do we take the examples of people you know, like me, like him, and like, like lots of others who've, who've gone through this process and figure out how to make that opportunity available to more people who are kind of suffering in these kind of obscure ways that may be amenable to this, this sort of approach. And in going through and looking at what people were doing, um, it really looks like a feedback loop um, where you observe, capture, reflect, and adjust. So you pay attention to what's going on, you capture it, it may be just in your memory, or it may be on paper, or maybe electronically. Um, you reflect on what was going on, the context around various experiences when you either did well or did poorly, and see if there's anything you can learn. And then you adjust your approach based on, on what you've learned. Um, and um, so we looked at this, and we said, OK, well, well what can we do here? And, and what, what, how can we contribute? How can we make this less of a burdensome process? Um, and what we realized is there's sort of this, this capture and reflect piece in the middle is really the piece that we can help with. Um, so this was around 2009 and, um, that, I, that I started um, saying, OK, you know, the tools suck. We need better tools. What can we do? And this is uh, conveniently enough when, when self-tracking devices started coming out. Um, so these are the, the Zio sleep monitor the body media um, armband, the Withings scale, and the Fitbit activity monitor. Um, and they all came out within a year or so of each other uh, around that time. And, um, and then there's also active tracking devices. Because there are things like, you know, you can, these guys can tell you certain kinds of things. They can't tell you other kinds of things. They can't tell you whether or not you're in pain. Um, they can't tell you what, you know, what, your, what your mood is. Um, and so uh, we started looking around for um, people that we could partner with who, who um, uh, had a good handle on this. And the best we found was, was uh, um, uh, some folks doing an app called MyMe that allows you to, uh, to do observation capture. And I'll talk about that more later. Um, and then just things like you know, taking pictures of things is, is very powerful, especially in dealing with food. Um, and then there's lots of other contextual data sources that may, not, may or may not be directly related to whatever you know, symptom or experience that, that is, that is of concern to you, but that um, allows you to reflect more deeply because it gives you more information about what the context was at the time. Um, you can never get all of the data into the computer. But what our hope is is that you get enough data into the computer that the person can look at, at that point in time and, and sort of um, figure out you know, where they were, what was going on in, in a way that they can sort of access that, that internal memories of that in ways that, that just sort of, you know, looking at the date on the calendar, you can't. Um, and so uh, we started building web tools. Um, we started a project called BodyTrack. Started building web tools. Um, in the last year, we merged with another open source project called Fluxstream that um, was doing similar sorts of things. And the idea is that, that basically we, we find um, data sources that contribute in useful ways to this, to this process for po people. And we figure out how to aggregate all the data, timestamp data, put them together in the, in the same system. And uh, here's an example of, from the first version. And you know, in all these cases, you, you really want to kind of understand both your personal context and also kind of relationships between things. And we, um, we built a little environmental base station um, that uh, talks to a, an air particulate monitor. And so the, the green and the black are air particulate readings, small and large. Um, and then we've got uh, humidity, light, and, and photos. And we just you know, wanted to sort of poke around and see what, you know, what, what, what goes on with air particulates, because it's not something that you can see, but it's potentially interesting. My husband has asthma, and so he's very interested to, to look into this. And um, you know, the, just 
what jumps out at you is there, there are these, these spikes with, the, these, uh, with, with these slow decays. And um, the, the, so some of these decays are like 12-hour decays on, on, on these spikes. Well, what are they? So when we start actually going and, and poking around and exploring, um, you, can, you can see that each of these really big spikes has something in common, which is these are all places where I was cooking a meal using a particular cast iron grill pan. Now, the meal's using the crock pot, the meal's using the skillet. Those didn't have these spikes, but this one particular pan did. Um, and you know, that's something we, we didn't know. And when we, and when we realized that, we stopped using that pan, um, started using the cast iron skillet instead. And then we don't, we don't have that happening to that degree. Um, it's also interesting in that the, the folks that we've worked with with this um, you know, all see pretty much the same thing. You get these, these spikes caused by, by, by personal activity. And a lot of times it's actually very interesting for things like you can tell when you're cooking, even when it's not you know, ridiculous like that. Um, you can tell when you're cooking versus going out. And that can tell you, for instance, you know, how, how well you're doing. You, you cook more at home when you're doing well than if you're not, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of interesting information to be gathered from stuff like this. And, and having an interface where you can just you know, go and explore it and see what there is and kind of understand the shape um, is, is really important. Um, this is an example with um, body media and zeo data. So this is um, body media activity. So number of the, the, the multiplier on basal metabolic rate. So like these spikes are like going out and walking or running. Um, and this is whether or not you're lying down. And um, then this, the, the zeo orange is awake. Um, the greens are, are um, deep in light sleep. And then the gray is, I'm sorry, uh, deep in REM sleep. And then the gray is, is light sleep. And you can just sort of, um, th this is an, a, kind of an example of using the exploration for, for just kind of remembering what things were like. So here I, I took a nap. Here I, it was a pretty good night of sleep, pretty active that day. Here I'm up, what's going on in the middle of the night there? Um, ah, so I got up and read email. Let's just, you know, walk into, the, walk into the computer, walking back. No big deal. Uh, oh, man, that's a mess. What's going on here? Yeah, looks like I'm going for a run here in the middle of the night. Well, it turns out that's waking up and being very, very sick. And it, it turns out that, I assume because of GSR, being very, very sick looks like you're running around. And, and so this is, this is now useful because you know, th this sort of thing happens to me sometimes. It's happened to me sometimes since I was in high school. And now you know, I can, it's, it's easy to find them because I know what they look like. Um, uh, here's an example using the, the newest system after, after combining with Flexstream. Um, and here we have um, some additional um, sort of interactivity. It's easier to add channels, select from all the available ones. You can um, modify the channel height. You can modify the channel settings. And you can go through and, and, and explore. Um, and this is an example from my own data. Um, so the, the, top, the, the main issue I still struggle with is, is happy versus unhappy guts. And four is happy guts. And the, the higher readings are, are unhappy. So you know, this is kind of an example of, of starting from some sort of symptom and then trying to understand what the context is. So you know, here, this, this looks really bad. What was going on then? Um, and so in the, in the new system, we actually have additional views, like a map view, where I can see, well, this is right after I got back from a trip to Boston. And I went out to dinner with some friends from out of town. What did I eat? OK, well. Pineapple, I almost never eat pineapple. That was desperation, getting, getting back in the middle of the night. And that was all I could find at the, the Walmart. And here's uh, some red wine at, with, uh, with the Brookses. And uh, I've, I was dabbling with, with, red, with red wine just you know, then. And, and, and in Belgium, I usually don't do that. Maybe that's not such a good idea. I'm, I, th I think the red wine experiment is done. Um, <laughs> and what we found, you know, sort of going through this and, and, and building the tools and, and trying to figure out um, you know, how this is going to contribute, is that the tools are important, but alone they're just not enough. Um, and sort of the, the typical story that you hear from this is, well, they're not enough because people are stupid. We don't think that. <laughs> we, think, we think very, very much differently than that. What we think is that passing on culture is complex. And really, what we're talking about here are cultural practices and developing and, and passing on cultural practices. And just like we don't expect somebody to learn how to cook by going to the store, buying a knife and a pan, and reading the user's manual, um, you know, that's kind of where, for some reason, that's where, where, 
we're generally at in the, in the tone of the discussions about self-tracking right now. And you know, we, we know with things like you know, cooking and fishing and stuff that, that that's, that's not how it works. You, know, you, you have somebody who knows what cooking is like or somebody who knows what fishing is like, and you, know, you hang out with them for a while, right? Um, and um, so we think that, that, that was sort of a, that, that's sort of a big missing piece. Also, um, revising personal narratives is an interactive process. Uh, and, the, and the best person I think I've, I've seen who, who, who explains this is um, Rachel Naomi Raymond in um, Kitchen Table Wisdom. She, she talks about how the process of interacting with other people and telling them our stories, we revise our stories, and we come up with, with, with new ones. And it's really this, this, this sort of process you can't do very well in your head. Um, and you know, having, having the tools helps, but the, the real um, thing that we're trying to support is this sort of process of self-narrative editing. And it works much better with a, with a second human. It doesn't have to be a trained human. It just has to be a human who will put up with you and who cares about you. <laughs> um, so we came up with this, um, me and, and Dr. Abramson, um, came up with this idea of, of quant coach. Um, somebody who um, kind of you know, knows the shape of the space, has kind of done it before, knows what the tools do, um, who works with somebody who's you know, got these sort of issues and who doesn't know how to use the tools yet. Um, to uh, kind of do, you know, skill development and 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 help translate. And um, having somebody who who kind of knows what what things do uh, to help select and configure and use the tools um, is just makes a huge huge difference. Because when you're by yourself, you know, a lot of these these um, sort of speed bumps that you hit along the way where you just don't know what to expect. Um, somebody who does know what to expect, you, know, you can, just, can just help you over them, and, it, and it's no big deal. But otherwise, I mean, people can really get stuck and, and, and not be able to get back to it. Um, and reflecting on the data together and looking at specific incidents, I think, is, is, is really, really useful. Um, you know, when you go and you talk to your doctor, you're really not usually able to go to the level of detail of looking at specific incidents. What you're talking about is your current, your current edit on your story. What is it that you currently believe? But it doesn't really give you the ability to see the context and to, and to sort of challenge your current set of stories and maybe to come up with some that you know, fit the data better. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. So one of the, we, we've done um, a number of pilots with this. Um, um, I've done um, two, my lab director's done one, um, and um, the Miami folks in, in New York have, um, are, are kind of doing an ongoing pilot. And Marcy was one of the participants in the first pilot that we did in August in California in preparation for the Medicine 2.0 conference. And Marcy's big issue was uh, sleep disruption. So this, the, the orange is, is she awake. Went to Burning Man. Yeah, <laughs> then she went to Burning Man. Um, so Orange is awake, and she'd had the, um, so this is, this is August, and um, she'd had a, a Zio since about May, and pretty much every night looked like this. Um, I'm not kidding you. It was, it was, so she's just waking up constantly and, you know, understandably um, concerned about that. And um, her number one theory as to what was going on is that her and her partner were waking each other up which you know, leads to some relationship stress and, and, um, and finger pointing and, and wasn't so good. And so uh, I actually worked with both of them um, and, um, they, and you know, doing the, the quant coaching thing. And it turns out that when they actually looked at the, at the data synchronized together, they saw that that's not what was happening. Um, she had some other ideas about food and stuff and caffeine that just didn't really pan out either. And then she went to Burning Man. And they had a... Um, a um, a ritual where you take your burdens, you symbolically put them on a pyre, you, you burn them, and then here we have perfect uninterrupted night of sleep. And she continued to have perfect uninterrupted nights of sleep. And when she came to talk to me after coming back, she was all excited because she's like, wow, you know, it's, I think I've figured it out. And the new story that she came up with based on this, this sort of surprise, uh, serendipitous event, is that maybe it had something to do with vigilance, some sort of low-level vigilance response that she wasn't really aware of or able to access that somehow going through this this ritual had had accessed for her and so now she's you know that wasn't on her li initial list at all but it, it's 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 working well for her um mike has has uh, sleep paralysis so sleep paralysis is where it's sort of the opposite of sleepwalking um you become aware but your your body is, is still paralyzed 
And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty disturbing. Um, it's been happening all his life, and there's really nothing that doctors can do about it. Um, there's no drugs, you know, no treatments. And, um, and so he didn't really have any stories, go any, any theories going in, like, other than, you know, sucks to be me. And um, so we, we started, you know, sending him up with Zio and, and Mimey, and he started tracking. And within the first week, actually, he, he, he had a, the first sleep paralysis episode. Yeah? How does Zio um, monitor your, your sleep states? Oh, it it's, has an EEG. So it's a, it's a little band, EEG, wireless band, um, and then they do classification on the, the base unit. And, um, and so I actually got email at you know, 3 something AM from Mike saying, I had a sleep paralysis episode. It's the first time I was happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was kind of funny, and it sort of points out how changing your role can actually change your your experience, even you know when you're still having the thing happen to you. Um, and so then uh, it happened a second time before before we met, and we looked at this together. And from this, he came up with an idea, which is an idea that he he hadn't thought of before, which is these are the nights he went to sleep the latest when his when his um, um, schedule was sort of most disrupted. So he said maybe it has something to do with circadian rhythm disruption which he hadn't thought of before. And so uh, he started working on how to reliably get to bed at 1 a.m. Um, and um, and yeah, that's something we've been, been working on since. And, and his experiences since have, have actually reinforced this idea of circadian rhythm disruption. Um, when, he, when he goes to Haiti and he's sleeping in a tent and, and getting up with the sunrise, it doesn't happen to him. When he flies to Italy and, and you know, is, is you know, in a hotel and, and, and many hours different, it happens. And, and so, you know, he, it's, um, and, and there's something he can do about it. You know, he's, and he's actively working on it. He's, he's getting better. He's not 100%, but he's a PhD student. So, um, uh, Alan is a um, engineer in the Bay Area, works for Fitbit. Um, he's uh, been a type 2 diabetic for like 26 years. And he was, he had two stent operations. Uh, his HbA1c was very high. He felt like he was doing everything he was supposed to do, and it just wasn't working. And he begged his doctor for a continuous glucose monitor. And so the green line here is a, a Dexcom 7 continuous glucose monitor um, sent to BodyTrack via the Upload API. And, um, and at the beginning, it's, it's out of range a lot. Um, and he actually, in paying attention to um, what happened, you know, he would eat something and then he'd kind of you know, watch the trending data and go out for a walk and watch the trending data. And he ended up coming up with strategies that were not the strategies his doctor told him, but that worked for him. And that, you know, as time got on, he, he got better and better at keeping it in between the lines. Um, and at this point, basically, he's got normal HbA1Cs, and his weight's way down. And Yes? So how does the glucose monitor work? Because you have to sample blood, right? Uh, interstitial fluid, actually. And the glucose, there's a slight delay, but it, but it measures the interstitial fluid. You have a little um, needle in your um, uh, tummy that wirelessly transmits to a little pod. Um, and it shows you a little graph and gives you the trending information in real time. Um, and you have to do finger sticks about I think, four times a day to keep it in calibration. Um, but you know, it's, he's, he said he's much, he's much happier doing the finger sticks, keeping it in calibration, and getting the data from it than he was. You know, he felt like doing the finger sticks alone, he was not getting the kind of insights he needed. And I'll give you an example here. Um, so the, the green line again is the, the Dexcom data, and this is uh, the Fitbit data. One of the things he noticed is that if he was getting out of bounds and he went for like a one to two mile walk, then over the next few hours it would come down. But with transients, okay? So depending on when you stick your finger, you're going to get very, very different answers here. And it's going to give you a very, very different idea of what the effect of this is. But when you actually have the continuous data and you can see it over the long run, you can see these trends. Um, and that really helped him to change, you know, his idea of how to how to act and how to how to self-regulate. Um, so, uh, talking a little more detail about kind of the process rather than just kind of the um, you know what what people found. Um, so this is this is Gordon. Gordon's been going for a couple weeks now. Uh, he talked to Dr. Abramson um, and then and, and talked to me before going down to um, uh, Australia, where he now is. Um, and so when he talked to Dr. Abramson, uh, he set him up with, um, with a MIME install. And MIME installs are all um, custom. And those of us who've been doing the quant coaching with, with MIME, one of the, the, one of the things that we do as part of the first meeting is um, 
talk to the person about what they want to capture, what they think is relevant, both in terms of um, kind of symptom or, or kind of experiential kind of things that they want to capture, and also contextual things that they think might be relevant and that they capture. And, they, and it can you know, change over time. But this is, this is you know, what he has initially. So um, angina and shortness of breath are sort of his main um, sort of symptoms that he wants to track and that, and that, that are a cause of concern to him. Um, and um, the exercise, so swimming, rowing, uh, walking, um, he wants to, to be able to, to see you know, what effect that has or doesn't have on, on that. And then um, HRV and food are things that he, think are, he, he thinks are potentially relevant context. Uh, HRV is heart rate variability. Um, it's a measure, a measure of sympathetic versus parasympathetic activation, so fight or flight versus um, uh, calm. And so what happens when he experiences one of these things, like when he experiences the, the angina pain, um, is that you hit the button and then um, you can put in a value, which optional value, optional comments, optional photo. Um, and then all of those get um, wrapped up and, and automatically pushed to the, to the, the cloud server. Um, and then we can, we can pull them from, uh, from there. Uh, also um, suggested to him getting a, a, body media, a, a new body media armband. Um, and, uh, and he's got a heart rate strap he's been using with a um, Sweetwater HRV app, which does not have an API. So he's, that's why he's doing it on, on MyMe. Uh, and um, then uh, he's got a body track account. The, um, um, the top two here come from the body media armband, the same ones I showed you before, um, activity and, and actually this one's sleep rather than lying down, but basically lying down with some noise. Um, and then HRV, he's recording from the Sweetwater. And then the, these are, are um, observations from the various MIME buttons. And he's taking pictures of his food so he can go through and he can see at various points in time you know, what he's eating. Um, and so you know, now that he's got the data, he can go in and he can reflect on it. And this is sort of you know, an example of going through and doing that, where here is a particular point in time where he had some angina pain. Uh, had some shortness of breath. And this is interesting in that he wasn't really doing much <laughs> um, when this happened. So, you know, what's up with that? Uh, interestingly, the HRV was incredibly low, uh, so which, which means that uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system activation, you know, so maybe that has something to do with it. Don't know. It's an interesting data point. Um, and then um, here he's actually quite active, and the, the pain's gone, a little shortness of breath, but. Okay, so it's not as simple as, you know, the more active you are, the more it hurts. Okay, so we've got more we need to learn, and, and, and he knows that. Um, and so let's, let's go and look at uh, um, more, uh, more data later on. Here's a time when he um, had some, some pain after, uh, after one of these sort of, sort of big activity spikes. It says, walk to pool in 90 degree heat, no past exercise, question mark. And then no pain on long walk, but slight, I think this is supposed to be as shortness of breath. Um, and so here, sort of his thinking about what's going on has, has, has evolved a bit. Um, this is um, walking to the pool after he hadn't exercised for a couple of days. So now he's like, okay, well, you know, I've seen, he's seen examples where he exercises and, and he's okay. Um, and, you know, so maybe it's because he wasn't regular enough. So now he's got that story. And, and, and the consequence of that story is he's probably going to try harder to be more regular about it. And, and this is the sort of thing that, that happens. It's like, you know, you don't know when you're early in the process like this where you're going to end up. But at each step along the way, he's got something positive he can do when this happens rather than just, you oh, you know, sucks to be me. Um, and, uh, and, and he can kind of go through and, and, and evolve these stories to, to fit what he sees as he goes along. Um, so one of the questions that keeps cropping up is how can we incorporate medical data and well, medical data in quotes. And what I mean by medical data is that there's sort of this, this big dividing line between everything I've been showing you, which kind of falls in the, the non-medical bin, uh, which you can do whatever the hell you want with, um, and the medical data over there, which essentially means that it, it originates within the medical system. It's the kind of stuff that your, that your insurance company perks up about. Um, and you know, there's, there's all sorts of data over here that's, the, that's potentially useful. And there's you know, the question of how to, 
how to leap the gap, and, and which direction should the gap be leapt. Um, there's an interesting example of someone um, who, you know, like me, is kind of in, involved in the quantified self movement named Larry Smarr, uh, who has been doing lab, frequent lab testing and, and has had some, some interesting experiences and some interesting results. And, and if, if you're interested in this, he's got some good presentations online. He presented also at the QS conference. Um, and so here he's been looking at um, CRP, which is an inflammation marker, and lactoferrin, which is a, another sort of more specific marker. Um, and by tracking that over time, and he, he didn't really have an agenda when he started. He's just, you know, oh, hey, lab tests. Um, but he, he noticed that, that these things would spike um, at, at various times and, and um, tried to understand it. And, and eventually, you know, he and his doctors realized that actually these are, these are um, uh, bowel inflammation episodes. Uh, and having that tracking data and being able to see things like, you know, how did it change over time? You know, what's the lead up to it? I mean, you know, before, before they realized anything was, was going wrong, it started going up. And, and you see interesting articles about things like this about, you know, it's like, well, six months before getting, getting um, diagnosed, you know, this, the inflammation markers were already going up, that sort of thing. So you can imagine that um, this kind of data could be really interesting for people going through this sort of process to be able to combine it with, all of the other experiential data and you know, what, are, what am I eating and you know, how am I exercising and, and stuff. Um, uh, so here's, for me, the current situation, which is, which is um, very non-explorable. I've got about a half inch thick stack of pieces of paper just of lab tests. These are, these are not even like you know, other sort of, sort of stuff. That's just the lab tests. Um, and um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being able to combine this with with you know the rest of the tracking data is is you know not in that form is is not so doable. Um, so how about importing into Health Vault? Yay, Health Vault. Okay, so I've got lots of lab test results in here now. Um, you know this um, this is looking up. Um, <clears throat> well, it's uh, it's digital now. It's secure, but it's still not explorable. Um, if you look at the lab tests, what what you get is um, the name of it and the date. And then you actually have to do a drop down in order to see what the value is. Um, <clears throat> and if you do this, this very juicy looking little export thing up here, the CSV doesn't have values in it either. Um, <laughs> um, so you know, it's, 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 it's a step in the right direction, but it's not yet as far as we need to go. Um, and one of the main things that, that we need is that we need to be able to support comparison over, over time. And actually, in, in my just sort of individual poking around, the paper still won. Um, the, the health vault was very, very useful to be able to do a search on the name of the test and be able to see the dates. But actually going through my, my you know, date ordered pieces of paper and, and folding them up and putting them next to each other was still much more usable to be able to see the trend than, than looking at it online in that form. Um, but there's an interesting example of a place where one of the API clients has made um, a specialized little tool that, you know, only for, for these particular fields, HDL, total cholesterol, et cetera. Um, but you can see the trending data over time. And, uh, and so this is cool. I mean, this is, this is definitely in the right direction. So, you know, can we make this more interactive and, and combine it, you know, more fluidly with, with other stuff? And my current hope for that, and part of the reason I was, I was, uh, I, I jumped at it when Gordon said, oh, hey, you should go talk to guys at Microsoft Research. Um, is the idea of actually Health Vault um, acting as a bridge um, between these worlds and um, being able to, you know, if we just made this sort of API client piece, um, um, being able to incorporate that kind of data together with the other stuff in BodyTrack. Uh, and, you know, there, and probably, um, you know, lab test results would be the, f the first thing that would be potentially useful. Um, and, um, and being able to, you know, sort of play with how to, um, um, how to deal with that, you know, rather than, you know, trying to, trying to deal with it directly. And so I think that, you know, Health Vault is really playing a unique role in the ecosystem right now. And it is the only thing that I've been able to find that, that you can just haul off and make an account on that um, is, is working on bridging this gap. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we can uh, sort of combine forces and, and take... Um, you know, some of the, the um, explorability tools that, that we've been working on and the, and the usage um, models for that and be able to also then leverage um, the health fault data. I think, I think that'll be awesome. So hopefully while I'm here, I'll be able to, you know, kind of, kind of uh, find out, you know, who are the, the right people to talk to um, 
as, as part of that vision, um, as well as you know, other folks in, in other, other departments. So, questions? Thank you. So, for folks like yourself who are trying to solve a mystery, uh -huh. can you be a little bit more explicit about what the practice is like today of doing hypothesis formation and then hypothesis testing? Uh, you mean in the in the standard sort of medical model or in the quant coaching model that we've been working with? Yeah. So, in, so for the quant folks, mm -hmm. it's so given the nature of the demos you, mm -hmm. you showed us, it looked like hypothesis formation is is almost sort of like a visualization task. You're just sort of browsing your data and, and well, uh, I think it's a it's a a task that um, the visualization is is part of the loop, but I think that that. Um, the the question of you know how do I you know what 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 story might better fit what hypothesis might better fit what I'm looking at is something that that naturally comes out of the process of going and looking at specific incidents and 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 talking about them with somebody you know what was going on well you know I I got up in the morning I went for a run I went to the museum um, you know blah 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 um, and you know you look at a few of those and it's like you know I've noticed that you know, whatever it is that you've noticed, maybe that's relevant. Let me go look at other incidents. You know, that, that kind of um, exploratory process is the best thing that I've been able to find for being able to do this sort of hypothesis generation and testing. And one of the really important things about that is because it comes from the individual's musings. Um, one, you have access to a source of data that nobody else has access to, which is your own, you know, sort of, um, um, personal memories that can be evoked through that process. Uh, and two, it makes it so that the person uh, whose life it is, is empowered and, and, is, and has agency. Um, and I think that that's really important. A lot of people are working on tools that, that basically um, do hypothesis generation in some machine learning kind of sense and then, and then feed it to the individual. But there can be sort of a gap between that and the things that they are interested in, in thinking about and interested in exploring and, and that, that might actually be, be something that, um, that will, will resonate with them. Um, and so I think that by having you know, the person themselves be the generator of that, it, I think there's something important about that. Uh, and, and, in, and in not being sort of you know, further um, kind of disempowered by the process. Yes. On the other side of the fence, less subjective, more object, objective, what mm -hmm. uh, devices, hardware, whatever, do you think uh, you're missing now that would be really helpful? Uh, good question. Um, so the uh, continuous HRV, I think, is, is sort of the, the next frontier that we all have hopes for. Um, and we actually have a, um, a bead on that right now, which is that the polar uh, HR7, which I have a picture of here, um, ah, here we go. So this little guy here it, um, is um, uses Bluetooth Smart, and it actually gives you R2R -R intervals, which look pretty dang clean. So the the first step in the process of doing uh, heart rate variability is is to have really really dang clean unfiltered uh, R2R intervals, um, and um, th this little guy now does this. So my my husband just in the last week has gotten um, uh, an uploader working for that that works on, um, so right now it's uh, iPhone 4S and 5 and iPad 3 uh, are sort of the only portable things that we know of that have a, a usable, developable um, Bluetooth smart stack. Um, the Androids aren't there yet, unfortunately. The ones that have the hardware still don't have the software. Um, and um, well, it depends on your usage. I mean, if you, if as part of sort of a, a, a biofeedback kind of thing, it's important to get real time. Um, for our purposes, real time isn't as important as having the accurate timestamps. Um, you want to really, really know when that happened in a, in a very precise sort of fashion, so you can combine it with with, with other things. Our, maybe you could hold a month worth of data with all that you're talking about, with a lot less power, and not having to have something. Right. So long as so long as it has a um, real time clock that it can sync up with enough, so that it doesn't have too much drift. Yeah. And if you look at the base station, for instance, that's that's what we do with that. Um, but um, 
the person who did the base station looked into it, and he said that the, the Bluetooth smart reception devices aren't there yet. Um, you have to build your own stack. And, and so it's just not quite there, but hopefully it'll get there. Mm -hmm. So for measuring stress, what are the trade-offs between using HRV and GSR? Um, so nobody really knows. And there, there, um, there are pluses and minuses of either one, um, both kind of in the, in the time domain, you know, how, how quickly they respond, um, and in terms of um, false, false parts of the signal. Um, and you know, really, you want both. Um, body media armband natively gets GSR. They will not give it to you um, via the, the commercial thing. Uh, you can get at, at it with the, the research band, but the, the uh, usability of the research band is unfortunately a complete disaster. Um, I mean, I have one, and it's such a, such a pain in the butt to use that I, that I don't. Um, so uh, there's something called the Q sensor that does continuous GSR and for $2,000 a pop. But I'm just not that motivated to deal with it, given that you know, five people I know could, w would be willing to buy one. And, and it's not going to have a bigger impact. This thing has a much, uh, much more appropriate price point. Uh, if there were a GSR sensor that was sort of comparably priced and comparably usable, you know, please, please let me know about it. Yeah, I haven't seen it. So you've developed an API with, with body track that's kind of geared toward the real-time data collection, and is that kind of extensible to new devices? And yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's actually geared towards um, aggregating data with, with other data sources. You know, so so you, have, you have the timestamp, and you have um, the device name and the channel name, and it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a packed JSON sort of format with um, uh, double floating point Unix time timestamps in it. And, it, and it's, it's, it's pretty simple to use. Um, and that's what we use for, um, like for instance, the Dexcom 7 data is, is being, you know, just, you know, it's a, I think you used a, you did a Perl script that just, that just called the just, you know, HTTP posts. Um, and, and so, um, and, the, and the new system has, has that as well. Um, and, you know, so hopefully, as these things become available, I mean, you know, we do our own little things, but hopefully the, the ability for, for this to, will expand in the, in, into the environment. And, there, and there's already several, several people who know how to do this and have been doing it for their own, their own little experiments. But you know, well, hopefully it'll, it'll grow. Any questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again.